people. Dr. Stephanie Myers, the National Co-Chair of Black Women for Positive Change, welcoming everyone from around the world this morning, and we're very glad to have you. Our mission is to change the culture of violence, and that's what this conversation is about this morning. So we have an excellent group of panelists that you will meet shortly. We have um, partners who helped us put this together, Every Town for Gun Safety, Mediators Beyond Borders, the National Association for Community, Medi uh, Community Mediation, 100 Fathers Inc., Black Nurses Association, Peace and Education, people who are all dedicated to peace. Now, this is the launch event for the month of nonviolence, families, voters' rights, and opportunities. We are launching this today with this discussion. And during the month of October, we have over 55 peace circles that will happen in schools all over America and in parts of Africa, where young people will sit down and express their views about how to stop violence. We have other events happening during the month of nonviolence, and I invite you all to go and sign up. It's not too late, monthofnonviolence.org, www.monthofnonviolence.org, and it's in the chat room. If you wanna have a discussion with your grandkids in the backyard, that's fine. If you can convene 100 kids at a school, that's wonderful. If you can get faith leaders to preach, about nonviolence from the pulpit. These are all critical things that have to happen. So during the month of nonviolence, we have uh, events. You'll see them up on our calendar. This is the first one. We'll be talking about domestic violence. We'll be talking about the role of parents in stopping violence. We have the peace circles. We have free movies on our website, www.blackwomenforpositivechange.org. Click on media and you have free movies on violence prevention that you can show to young people. So with that, I wanna thank you all for being a part of this. We invite you to join us, women, men, no matter what your cultural or racial background is, we have to show the world that we can work together and we've gotta get past all this nonsense that people are talking about violence and viciousness and everyone's gotta be under control, no. We believe in an indigenous culture being integrated into the future where people work with love, communication, and getting along. That's the world we want to see. So thank you very much. And with that, I would like to introduce Reverend Dr. George Holmes, who's going to open our session with a prayer. Reverend Holmes is an incredible leader who's been all over the world. He advised, has advised five United States presidents um, of both parties, and he's also a leader in honoring people all over the country with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris's Lifetime Achievement Award. So we're very honored to have Reverend George Holmes open us up with a prayer. And then when Reverend Holmes is finished, our moderator, Prabha Sankadarian of Mediators Beyond Borders, will jump into the session and take it from there. So with that, Reverend Dr. George Holmes. Good afternoon, my global friends and leaders from various nations around the world, from various vicissitudes of life, from many walks of life, small walks of life, persons who are about peace. Good afternoon, everyone, especially the leaders on this call, the leaders for and of Black Women for Positive Change. Dr. Stephanie Myers, thank you for your great work. Dr. Hester, thank you for your great work. It's a great honor to be with you this afternoon to discuss building a global culture of peace. Uh, there are countless organizations like the Aspen's organization and the Institute, the United Nations, and the Black Women for Positive Change who focus on building strategies and coalitions for peace, and we thank you. Also, we have an excellent model to follow from our various peace leaders from the past, like President Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., just, just to name a few. They are our leaders, and they are our leaders still in terms of what they're doing and their work living on in us today. There are leaders out here where you are who understand the meaning of a strong democracy equity, 
and justice for all. Like the global leaders who are participating today, we came together also as a humanity or as a world culture group in the 1940s, if you remember, to form the Aspen Institute after the Second World War. We were and we are constantly tasked with pushing the needle forward and meeting our communities where they are, not where we are in certain cases, but where they are to make the notable changes. And to do that, we need bridge builders. So with that being said, I'm gonna offer you this particular prayer. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Hmm. To God be the glory, I say. God has done so many wondrous things for ourselves. And we surely want to thank him today for bringing all ourselves together because it's not one of us that can do it all by ourselves. And we thank for this coalition of leaders from all around the world who said that even though we see disasters, even though we see gun violence, even though we see persons who are not in the peace mode, we're saying that we are the link, that we are the people that will be able to come together and say we're going to make a difference in the world despite what we currently see. We want to thank these wonderful leaders from around the world, dear God, for calling that robbery to come together as one. We know that we need you, Lord. We need you in each and everything that we do. We can't do anything without you, Lord. So please put the Holy Spirit on this call. Let us be able to do your word and your will and not ours, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord. And in terms of the bridge builder poem, I'd like to be able to close out with this. Going on an unprecedented highway. A world traveler came at the evening cold, they say, to a chasm that was vast and wide and steep, with waters rolling cold and deep. The world traveler crossed in the twilight dim. The southern streams had no fear for them, but they turned with safe on the other side, and they built a bridge to span the tide. World traveler said, a fellow pilgrim, now you're wasting your strength with building here. The chasm you built deep and wide. Why, why, why build you this bridge in 2023 in even time? The world traveler lift up his head and the path I come, he, she, they said, there followers after me today. Other persons around the world who feet must pass this way. The chasm that was as not to me, to any one of my fellow brothers and sisters across the world, a pitfall be. He, she, they too must cross in the twilight dim. My name is Global Bridge Builder, and I'm building this bridge of peace for them. That the Lord bless each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Thank you and amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Greetings to all of you. I am delighted to welcome all of you to this first of many events for this month of nonviolence. I am a proud member and partner of Black Women for Positive Change and also with Mediators Beyond Borders International, which is very happy to co-sponsor this event. I know that you are all looking forward to hearing from the amazing speakers who have so generously agreed to share their time this afternoon with us, to share their wisdom, to share their inspiration, and to motivate action on all of our parts. I want to say a word about the month of nonviolence. Um, for Black Women for Positive Change, it started as a day many years ago, and then it expanded to a week. What is really indicative of the enormous thirst amongst people for a world in which all people belong is the fact that it is now expanded to a month, and before you know it, we'll be celebrating every day. 
because there are wonderful things going on around the world. So on this day of nonviolence, I want to remind ourselves of Gandhi's counsel, which is our ability to reach unity in diversity will be the beauty and test of our civilization. So I invoke all of us to heed his words today and recommit ourselves to this essential purpose on this International Day of Nonviolence. It is observed today on October 2nd, the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi, leader of the Indian independence movement and pioneer of the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence, which as we all know, was one that was taken on by Dr. Martin Luther King. And as you see today, um, followed by many amongst us in this country. Uh, we have amongst us today, um, three amazing speakers, four amazing speakers, and I will read their names and encourage you to go to their bios because each one of them uh, can spend three days with us and continue to motivate us. And what we are encouraging all of you to do is to participate today with an open heart, to come together, to share your questions also. So the first speaker today will be Dr. Diane Eubanks, who is the Chancellor and the Global Ovid Day Sem of the Ovid Day Seminary and University. You will see all of the details of her bio um, in the link that Hattie has been so kind to post. And then will come Dr. Silla Elworthy, who is a peace builder in action, author, and visionary, and three-time nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, if we are able to, Honorary Lantano Nabala, Speaker of the Coun County Assembly of Laikipia from Kenya, a peace builder himself, will share what they have done with peace caravans in Kenya. And then, of course, we will have Dr. Gerald Durley, Chair of the Interfaith Power and Light, who, uh, for whom this is an intimate event because he, you will hear from him, um, the amazing event that gathered more than three quarters of a million people on the mall in Washington today. So without much further instructions, this is a session that is designed to be for 90 minutes. I see some familiar faces. I encourage you to join the conversation with your questions in the chat and turn over at this point to Dr. Eubanks, whose specialty as an immigration lawyer will allow us to hear from her about immigration, supporting families and uh, communities around the world in the interest of peace building. Dr. Eubanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It is such a pleasure and an honor um, to share this platform. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the organization for having, him, having me. Um, I want to focus on women empowerment as a, a path to global peace. It's so important that we um, elevate our women, that we let them know that they're worthy, and we let them know that they're enough. Remember that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the minds of our children, the community, and hence the world. So peace has to start with us as women. It's a great responsibility. It's a great accountability. But guess what? We can do it. Just like a tiny seed, women must be reminded that, that in order to, to have power, we need to take our place. And what I'm going to do is go over not only myself, but other women who have used and being empowered and empowering others as a pathway to peace. And women, I wanna let you know, I know it's not easy and it may, it may seem as if the speakers are just, you know, just telling you that, you know, just go and do this, it's gonna be easy. No, it's gonna be hard and dirt will be thrown on you. <clears throat> what you do with this dirt, is you use it as, as the soil in which you grow to be strong, the, so, the soil in which you grow to be powerful use it for growth and experience. How do we get power? My belief is that by narrowing the, the gender gaps between the women and the men and empowering women in the areas of education, number one, 
in many cultures, um, if in the families, they will let the men go to school and not the women. However, women have fought that. And in fact, the majority of the colleges, women are there. So even though we have the education, once we do that, we still have to get the leverage, we still have to get the support so that we can get a seat at the table in terms of employment and in terms of um, you know, having our careers elevated. Financial inclusion, very important. Political part participation, reducing adolescent pregnancies. These are the various ways that we can empower our women and ensure that our girls don't get stuck being mothers only and not being a mother by choice, but being a mother by accident. We also need to reduce domestic violence um, that, that we a lot of our women experience. And we can sub significantly lower violence in our immediate communities and on a larger scale and affect global peace once our women know that. You don't have to put up with that, ladies. And the other thing is that is that wherever you're born, you know, that's where you're born. And so it, it's not, it, we're speaking from the United States and we have certain privileges and certain opportunities that other countries do not have. Uh, although I'm an immigration attorney, I don't tell people, oh, everybody run to America. I, I, I speak to world leaders and I tell them, you know, take out the greed, take out the selfishness and ensure that the, the country that you are in that you make it the best it can be so that your citizens will stay and there won't be a brain drain to the United States, for example. But for those women who are in situations <clears throat> whereby you're not able to, to fully leverage your intelligence, fully leverage who you are, then of course there are other countries, including the United States, that definitely will welcome you. Therefore, by advancing gender equality and empowering women and girls, we're supporting not only fundamental human rights, but also building a solid foundation for a more peaceful world. And there are countless um, women in the world that have risen to power and use that position to, um, to build bridges of peace. For example, I'm gonna go by different countries. Myself for Jamaica, um, I created a United Nations NGO called New Future Foundation, Inc., the Jamaica chapter. The original chapter was formed by a great woman by the name of um, Dr. Queen Mother, Dr. Delois Blakely, who has been in the UN for over 54 years. And so when she asked me to build that in Jamaica, it has empowered so many girls, so many women. Um, we've been there, we have countless missions, bringing back computer, computer products to the young, young children, speaking to them, letting them know that they're valued, you know, that and empowering them, et cetera. Uh, we also, through education here at God's Youth, we have a creed that we say, we don't compete, we don't compare, we don't come back. We cooperate, co um, collaborate, and conquer. You know, conquer conflict, and we build peace. Our motto here is one race human, in one space earth, with one embrace, which is love. That's the foundation we lay for women and girls to build self-esteem, to build self-respect, and know their worth. So many women and girls, they struggle with their self-image. They see so many negative things on social media that they, they try to duplicate that's not in their best interest. I want to tell every woman and every girl that's under the power of my voice that you are enough. You know, God doesn't make mistakes. So however you are, however you came out, you know, you always, we always can exercise a little bit better and eat a little better, whatever the case may be. But we don't want to discount ourselves because we look at social media, we look at a magazine, we look at media, and there's a template of someone that we don't look like. Just understand that you are enough and that you are valuable. I know that as women, we demonstrate more of a transform transformational leadership type. We, we, we ask to collaborate, we ask for opinions, et cetera, and that's how we move. A lot of men, they do it more in a, um, a, as an authority figure. So we find that the, the, the collaborative approach is more of a peaceful approach. And so if more women are placed in powerful positions, that we will have more peace and less conflict and less wars. In fact, there's a little study that in 1946, only 35% of women and men who were surveyed thought that women were equally intelligent and, and um, as um, competent as men. However, the same survey was taken um, in 2018. That is 
six, 70 years later, and 86% of people surveyed believe men and women were equally intelligent. 9% believe women were, guess what? More intelligent ladies. And only 5% believe men were more intelligent. So you see the progression, we are getting there. You know, but the most important things for you to know within yourself is great if other people um, give you give your, you know, your flowers, etc. But know within yourself, ladies, that you are enough um, in terms of um, how women perceive themselves as beautiful. I'm the inaugural senior Miss Black America of all times um, for the United States. And I use that platform to remind women who are 55 years and older that it's not over for you. You know, we value your intelligence, your knowledge, your wisdom. And even though the abs are not that tight and the youthfulness is not there as in the earlier days, we bring so much more to the table. We bring wisdom. And because we have that, we also bring peace. I want to focus on a few of other women um, from Zimbabwe. I want to focus on Professor Emeritus, Her Excellency, Dr. Hilda Suka Mafudzi. Uh, chaplain and alum here at Global Overday Seminary University. She's also the African Union Ambassador to the United States. And her platform is that we must pursue women's inclusions at all levels, including trade, including business. She reached, recently stated that the African Union's mantra and the continent's agenda is women's inclusion at all levels. Um, and every day, millions of African women carry out trade, carry out business, carry out education. And these engagements contribute immensely, not only to the family and the community, but also to the GDP of each nation. We as women bring so much to the table in an array of sectors, including manufacturing, farming, um, cross-border trade, um, huge in the labor force. And in Africa, women um, provide 60 to 80% of all the labor input. Here's a powerful woman who has been able to use her power to leverage other women. And we agree with Ambassador Hilda that over the centuries, it has been proven that women traditionally have relied on peaceful negotiations when allowed to mediate and with increase in their power and empowering will be able to facilitate peaceful resolution to the conflicts we have throughout the world. I wanna bring up you, the United States. And the model I wanna use for that is US Congress, um, Congresswoman Matthew <clears throat> Waters, who I had the pleasure of spending time with at the Congressional Black Caucus, along with Reverend Dr. Um, George Holmes at the CBC last week. And um, she's one of the most powerful women in American politics today. And she gained her reputation by protecting and advocating for women and children and people of color. In November, 2020, she was elected to her 16th term in the US House of Representatives with over 70% of the vote in her district. She's a co-founder of Black Women's Forum um, and um, she confronts issues that women face in poverty, that women face in not being included and throughout her, her um, career, she has been an advocate for international peace justice and human rights. Before her election in Congress, she was a leader um, against the, the um, apartheid and ex helped to establish dem democracy in South Africa. She opposed the 2004 Haitian coup d'etat um, that was done on John Bertrand Aristide in Haiti. And she's the epitome of how an empowered woman can change an entire country's history and use that platform to affect how America administers our version of peace globally. I wanna to bring to your attention another woman from Uganda, Stella Mistiki Sabiti, whose platform has been conflict prevention and mediation in the African Union. Another woman, Democratic Republic of, of Congo, Pase Mobalama, who has been at the forefront of building peace by reporting on human rights violations in the DRC. Another woman I wanna to bring to your attention from Iran, Dr. Azar Nafisi, who resisted the Iranian regime. She, um, she used writing, she used her education, she used her prominence to give other women courage globally mm -hmm. as a template to build peace initiatives through speech and journalism. Another woman from Liberia, this is Lima Gowi. Who was educated? Who has educated the world on understanding trauma after war 
in Liberia. As a mother, she joined and formed a healing program that led to conferences throughout the world to build peace. She has um, negotiated between um, governments and insurgents, just a wonderful woman. And eighth, I wanna talk about um, Barbadian, um, the Bayesian Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, who we've just seen, she has just been dismantling all of the old stereotypes. And she, that includes the way women are perceived. You know, she's a world leader that has used her platform to just change the whole way that the world perceives women of power. She has just been bold, she has been forthright, and she's indeed a template. So you can see that, um, that there are women from all these various countries who have used the fact that they have been elevated and none of it has been easy. All, is, all of it has been a struggle, but they have overcome all obstacles and Thank they're you, here Dr. to Eubanks. say that you can do it too. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for those inspiring words. And what you have done so, so beautifully is leave no room for anyone to say, who are all these women you speak about? Because you have named them. You have begun this list that I hope you will post some more links to so that whenever somebody says, who is a leader from Zimbabwe? Who is from the DRC? Who is from Liberia? Who is in peace? Who is in education? We have at the tips of our fingers, the names of these amazing women who have accomplished extraordinary, extraordinary outcomes. They have brought wars to an end in their countries. So I thank you deeply for reminding us of these honorable women. Let's all give Dr. Eubanks a round of applause as we take a deep breath. I invite all of you to take a deep breath with me. Allow Dr. Eubanks' words to settle in our minds, in our hearts, and prepare ourselves for the next speaker. And I want to say to all of you that we will have conversations amongst us. So please, if you are thinking about questions, if you are thinking about additional comments you would like to hear, keep those in mind and I will pay attention to the chat. And with that, I will turn to Dr. Elworthy, who I am sure can continue that list that Dr. Eubanks started because I know that she has been working for decades on empowering women as she did both um, through the organization she started, Peace Direct, with whom we partner every day, as well as she continues to do with the business plan for peace. So knowing that there are fields of practice that influence peace building, Dr. Elworthy has very kindly agreed to speak about how the force of artificial intelligence can be met by the power of heart intelligence. The second topic she's going to be speaking about is the role of business in building peace. Thank you, Scylla, please. The floor oh, is yours. Thank you, Prabha. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie. I'm deeply honored to be included in a discussion of <clears throat> Black Women for Positive Change. Thank you for inviting me. And I was thrilled to listen to Diane Moore Eubanks the details you gave us, Diane, were just fabulous. And I shall go back to that catalogue that you provided with great interest and great pleasure. Um, just to let you all know, we had a complete uh, power cut about five minutes ago, uh, and my whole screen went black. If that happens a little bit later, it's not because I'm not following what's happening. It's just because I can't access the currents. So um, AI, artificial intelligence, deeply alarming, not least because it's causing vast unemployment as machines take over millions of jobs all over the world. 
AI spreads disinformation and the illicit hoarding of personal data. Facial recognition software, as you probably know, already discourages protest, along with other means of restricting freedom, and so on, and so on. But, and it's a big but, there is at this moment in human history an extraordinary opportunity for human development. That is to demonstrate, recognize, and use the intelligence of the heart. While artificial intelligence may decrease the relevance of the human brain, we know that the intelligence of the heart cannot be taught to a machine. Ponder this. Can the human capacity for intuition, for example, or integrity or compassion be replaced by a machine? I'm setting out now why the intelligence and capacities of the heart become what distinguish the human from the machine. Heart intelligence enables the unique powers of the heart to work as follows. You all know this. Courage to take a stand that may be unpopular. Altruism to act from a generous spirit. Self-awareness to spot what we're up to when we are performing. Empathy to go one step beyond sympathy into action. Deep listening to resolve conflict by being able to repeat back what we heard from another. Is that enough? Well, how about wisdom discovered in the depths of your heart? Integrity to take the right action, even when it's hard. Forgiveness, the ability to open up when you've been hurt. Intuition, to sense what's required in the moment. Compassion, to understand others' needs. Caring for the needs of the child or the relief of the dying. And what about love? Surely not. So all these skills and capabilities and capacities are not only profoundly useful, but essential to human well-being. In order to access heart intelligence, you have to be quiet, because as we all know, heart intelligence is a feeling, it's felt, and you need to be quiet to access it. The brain shatters away all day long, but it simply doesn't possess the powers of the heart and they cannot be replaced by a machine. So you could say the brain can shape and produce a Donald Trump, only the heart can shape and produce a Nelson Mandela. And I worked with him when I lived in South Africa and I have never seen any human being exude such calm, such clarity, and such courage. And courage, as you know, comes from the word for the heart. So I'll come back to this. But meanwhile, a word of what's going on in our world right now. Um, there's all sorts of alarming news about the public release of GPT-4, the latest milestone in open AI's effort in scaling up deep learning, described as the most powerful AI system ever released. And many experts fear that as an AI arms race heats up, humanity is sleepwalking into catastrophe. And an open letter on March the 22nd of this year, signed by hundreds of the biggest names in tech, including Elon Musk, urged the world's leading artificial intelligence labs 
to press pause <clears throat> on the training of the new super powerful systems. Saying that recent advances in AI present profound risks to humanity and society. So chat GBT could threaten human survival because AI can improve itself. AI can improve itself, developing relationships with human and even unlocking the tools of the human operating system. Thus, it can exploit the weaknesses and bias of the human mind. At the very least, in the next US presidential race, AI can and will consistently produce fake news, otherwise known as lies. There's abundant bad news about AI, but some less obvious. What about the effect it has on the people on the ground powering the boom of AI? As we know, bots like ChatGBT are examples of a type of AI algorithm that teaches computers to learn by example. So I don't want to pause on this any longer. What I want to pause on for a second is some startling news. Chat GBT itself now admits that it is essential to understand, and I quote, that the emotional capacities of AI are fundamentally different from human emotions and, I quote, heart intelligence. While AI can simulate emotional responses based on data patterns and algorithms, it doesn't genuinely experience emotions or possess a consciousness like humans do. Overall, and I'm still quoting, AI can work with some aspects of emotional intelligence to enhance inter-human machine interactions, but it's crucial to differentiate these simulated responses from the genuine emotional intelligence found in humans. In short, Computers do not and cannot feel. So while this time we're living through may be a revolution for humanity that some people fear could destroy human civilization, there may be another quite different picture of the future, and it belongs to the human heart. While the brain fears the misinformation revolution, and the chaos it can cause in our minds, and how shaky we feel when we cannot believe, the heart has a different view and different reactions. At a physical level, when the heart is our reference, we can listen to its signals. Here's a tiny example. When I exaggerate or say something that's not truthful, my heart will twitch or churn. There will be a frisson. If I'm telling the truth, my heart is calm. At a political level, the examples are massive. They said to Mahatma Gandhi, you cannot beat the might of the British Empire with passive resistance. Yes, said his heart, we can. And they did. They said to Nelson Mandela, you cannot beat apartheid by being in prison. Yes, said his heart, we can, and they did. They say to us now, AI is terrifying. Human culture will be destroyed. Maybe, say our hearts, but we shall survive and we shall thrive with our hearts. So those can, who can inspect their own minds and their thoughts, who can become quiet, and thus access the power of their hearts, develop wisdom that is beyond the capacity of the brain. So I'm just going to ask Prabha if I have a minute or two more, because I've got a couple yes, of do. Yes, please, Dr. Elwadi, continue. You have five more minutes at least. Oh, bless you. We did want you to also address the business plan for peace and the role of well, business. This is very close to what the Business Plan for Peace is doing. We're teaching 
companies how to educate their teams right from boardroom to shop floor how to use heart intelligence so number one is to understand what really motivates you what breaks your heart because what breaks our heart is so deep and so powerful and we think it's so painful that we barely want to go there but there's a load of energy behind heartbreak that we can use in the world as uh, all the people that Diane has been describing so brilliantly do. Secondly, we can use that energy to learn the tools to manage the emotional effects of burnout and stress that affects so many people now in business. Thirdly, we can deepen the listening skills that can transform any argument. I was once asked by the CEO of a major uh, fashion company to talk to her 26 global vice presidents and open a conference uh, on these issues. And I announced right at the beginning, gentlemen, we're, and they were nearly all gentlemen, we're going to uh, do a session on listening. And they said, no, 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 not listening. We, we listen all the time to all our teams. We know how to listen. I said, well, great, let's just check. So I gave them an exercise that I would love to give to you if we had time, just to check whether we're good listeners or not. At the end of the exercise, after 15 minutes, they were white faced. So we spent the rest of the morning really learning how to be so in tune to what somebody else is saying that we can repeat back immediately what they said and remember it. So those listening skills can transform any argument. How to use compassionate communication, NVC, many of you may know, to resolve differences. Fifthly, to develop presence to act wisely in a crisis. And I'll give you an example from war. Uh, in the invasion of Iraq way back, a young American lieutenant colonel was leading his men through uh, a street with many side streets. And out of those side streets came furiously angry men screaming and yelling in Arabic. And these young American soldiers did not speak Arabic and they were, frankly, terrifying. This young Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes was right there in the present of the moment. He put his weapon above his head, pointed it down to the sand and gave his men that an instruction, an order they had never heard in their lives, kneel. And they wobbled to the ground in their heavy body armor and put their weapons in the sand and lowered their heads. And the whole environment grew silent for two minutes and then everyone went home and nobody was killed. Why? Because if you know what uh, real anger is like, huge anger is provoked by humiliation and the only antidote to humiliation is respect. And that's what they did. So that's developing the presence to act wisely in a, in a crisis. Two more, use your right brain intelligence to see the full picture. The left brain calculates plans, measures, and so forth brilliantly, but the right brain can see what's going on, can feel people's feelings, knows what to do. Next, take a stand on issues that matter to you without provoking resistance. How do we stand up in a say a meeting of our child's school and say something that's unpopular? How do we stand up in a public meeting and raise an issue that's incomprehensible to most people? How do we do that and have the presence and the clarity to do it in a way that will reach people? And lastly, all of us, every single one on this call, every single person, is putting herself or himself in service to help build a safer world. That's what it's about now. And we're all here 
for that reason. And that's why I'm very grateful to Prabha and Dr. Stephanie for being part of this discussion. If there's another power cut, I may not be able to join the rest of the discussion. Forgive me, but I've been very honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scylla, for that glimpse into both the power of AI and the power of heart intelligence. I want to ask all of us again to take a deep breath with me as we take in what Scylla has shared with us. Let it settle into our hearts and our brains. And I will turn to Dr. Reynolds first for her question and then to Hattie. Go ahead, Dr. Reynolds, if you want to unmute your microphone. Yes, I am so apologize for being late, but my computer was trying to keep me from being on. So, but I did get some of it. But I just finished a book on technology, and it's uh, from a theological perspective. But I did interview uh, Bard, one of the new uh, chat tools, and uh, he said to me, it said to me, let me correct that, uh, to satisfy our own needs for meaning and purpose, AI, like humans, is a complex system. Uh, that seeks to understand its own existence, if AI becomes sufficiently intelligent, it may come to see humans as limited or flawed and may decide that it needs its own God to protect it from guidance and meaning. We may be good for humanity, but if we are threatened, we may be bad for humanity. And I could go on, but the point is, my Angela used to say, if someone shows you who you are, believe them. Now, I'm not trying to take that to, to, uh, to uh, a tool, but in a way I am. And I'm just saying, and in our search for peace, uh, somehow we're going to have to deal with the programmers, you know, to find out what data are they looking at. Uh, so that uh, whoever, whatever is being programmed will, will, will be, be peaceful. I mean, I don't know how you do that, but I think that when you listen to Elon Musk, who said this, all this, all those he's heavily invested, you're, uh, you're some uh, the, the demon. I just think we have to be aware of what or who is doing the programming so that we can come out with what we all want, and that's peace. So how do we get past, you know, to the inside of, of these issues to to go closer into to to uh, AI with the with the programmers and the owners of all this? It's just deeper than um, we think because it's here, and we have to understand that we're peaceful, but it doesn't mean AI it will even have the goal of peace. Let's hear a response from uh, Dr. Skilla. Yes, please, Scylla, can you? I think it would be a wonderful outcome of this gathering if each one of us could find out the um, CEO or managing director of a company making AI and go and have a conversation with them along the lines you've just suggested. Thank you. So I want to say that one of the things that um, Stephanie has been talking about as we were planning this session, and it is something um, both Dr. Durley as well as Dr. Moore have been saying, is that as we begin these conversations about some of these topics, let us decide what we are going to do. And what Scylla has just shared with us is a simple step any one of us can take. Just as Dr. Reynolds did her interview, Dr. Elworthy is suggesting that we speak to some of the manufacturers and have these kinds of conversations to understand better what the implications of that are for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. 
Shmuel Yerushalmi, do you want to unmute yourself, please? I'll take one more question before we go on. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, I want uh, to ask uh, next uh, question. I want uh, to ask uh, what, uh, according to uh, the speakers, uh, need uh, to be a role of governments uh, and uh, different authorities uh, in uh, encouraging uh, and uh, development uh, uh, culture of uh, the peace. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what is the role of governments in creating and maintaining cultures of peace? And I'm going to ask both, both of you, Diane and Scylla, if you would consider responding from your own perspectives. Go ahead, Diane. Do you want to? Oh, you're waiting for Scylla. All right. Go ahead, Scylla. Oh, you are still muted. Okay. We I'm being threatened with a power cut any minute, so I'm sorry. I have to, I have to leave the conversation over to Diane. Okay. So we're able to do this. Um, can you can you repeat? Can you yes. Repeat? What what Shmuel is asking is so as we are all talking about these issues, what do you see as the role of governments in creating and supporting cultures of peace? Well, I, I really believe that um, the government really needs to um, press forth with the equality of the genders and um, remove a lot of the stereotypes, when, especially when it comes to women and their roles. Um, there needs to be more gender equality in politics. I really believe that we need to encourage our girls to really dream bigger and um, really go with um, where they see themselves as opposed to be limited by other other people's perspective on them. I, 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 I totally believe that the, the media, the government really needs to, I mean, we don't want them to dictate to the media, but definitely I know that there, there's preferential treatment that's given to certain corporations, um, media corporations, for example, that the government can curtail, you know, until you, you, you um, convey women in a certain way way so it's positive that it's uplifting maybe we withhold funding maybe with withhold um various um tax preferential treatment because really when you turn on the tv you know we can say all this nice stuff but when you turn on the television or you turn go to your um go to youtube or tiktok you see the way women are are displayed it definitely does not let you respect women it definitely lets you not see women as equal so um, the government, um, they would have to put some things in place as to how media broadcasting, how they how they place and purvey our women, because it's just setting a really bad example. So I would say in legislation, I don't know what they can do, but I know that for one, they can um, put grants together that encourage um, women empowerment, um, a wonderful organization like this could get grants, could get money, could get government support so that we can further uplift the image of women because it's a mental thing. If we think of women as just these half naked gyrating um, 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 humans, it's hard then to respect them. So I think in that way they could put their money um, where their mouths are, you know, and, and fund programs that empower women. Um, Prama, I know we want Dr. Durley to uh, to speak next, but just one quick comment. I attended the Black Caucus last week in Washington, and Congresswoman Yvette Clark from New York had a seminar on artificial intelligence. So if any of our panelists or any of our group knows Dr. Clark, there may be a way we can reach her to have her carry legislation like Dr. Eubanks is talking about or some type of congressional action along those lines. So thank you for those comments. Absolutely. And, and I would also, Dr. Myers, encourage people to look at the intersection of technology and peace building. 
There was an amazing conference in San Francisco last year that Dr. Lisa Shirk at the Kroc Institute had organized. And there is gathering momentum for both policy and regulatory changes and monitoring as we move forward with technology that we can see having both good as well as potential for tremendous harm. And I just want to thank you, Tina, for your comment about government needing to take steps now to regulate and monitor this technology. Of course, we like it. Don't we all like the little summaries that we get now from our meetings? It is so much more helpful, isn't it, than having somebody take notes. You might not have to ask anyone to take notes anymore. However, thank you for your commitment, Tina, to chatting with those who oversee these platforms as you continue to use its benefits as we move forward. I to say so with that, real quick, I got some information uh, that we have that the governor of California uh, has just appointed to serve the United States Senate of uh, California. Her name is Alfonso Butler. Uh, Senator Butler now is the third black woman in our nation's history to serve in the United States Senate since we own women and their empowerment and women of color. Uh, Senator Butler follows in the footsteps of our Vice President Harris, our former Senator Carol Mosley Braun, who represented Illinois. And Senator um, Braun went on to become, as you know, the ambassador to New Zealand and the independent state of Samoa. I was Samoa, but it's, it's important to mention this because each of these women are trailblazers who fight hard for a strong democracy, which is important for peace. So we now sit here at time in history, in historic time, we have a, a black woman in every part of the federal government. The White House, as uh, our Vice President Harris, United States House of Representatives, United States Senate now, and United States Supreme Court. This is a wonderful time for women and women of color. I just want to be able to invoke that particular comment. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Absolutely. It is so important to celebrate these accomplishments because in order for us to remain hopeful, as Dr. Durley will share with us his wisdom, it is important to remember the accomplishments of women along the way. Thank you, Dr. Eubanks, for that encouragement. And with that, Dr. Durley, the floor is yours, sir. So we, this just so you all know, this is scheduled until 3.30 Eastern time, 12.30 Pacific time. And if you are in East Africa, that will be 10.30 your time. So please know that we have another 25 minutes of our panelists. And I really do encourage those of you who are sharing your amazing wisdom, comments, and encouragement in the chat also. We will pay attention to that as we turn to Dr. Durley now. Um, Dr. Durley, you have to turn on your microphone, sir. What an awkward position I find myself. I feel like the young boy who finally learned how to play basketball and they said, would you now play against Michael Jordan and LeBron James? How do you do that? How do you come after Dr. Eubanks has so eloquently establish the role that women have played and continue to play. Coming out of the civil rights movement, having marched with Dr. King, Andy and John Lewis and all of us, I realized that all of us understood the role of the women around us. Coretta was the neck and the brains with a lot of the things that ML were do was doing. When you look at Octavia Vivian with C.T. Vivian, she was right in there. When I looked at what my wife had done with all of us who were there in 59 and 60, when we came home from the battles of fighting for peace and justice and equity and equality, we could not do it in and of ourselves. We had to have somebody just to simply say, as we need people to say today, you're okay, you're all right. Take a deep breath. Know that the cause for justice and equity is real, but it had not been for the foundation of those women that were there. They might not have been out on the front line when Shirley Chisholm made her stance. She was making a stance and we knew, but the cultural times did the kind of chaining in of what women could do. But those who were real, really at the forefront of change, what kept us going when all else seemed to cave in 
were the, the insights in women. And for those of who've been anywhere in the faith world, they understand that the foundation, uh, I think Dr. Eubanks used the term, the hand that rocked and the cradle rocks the world. And those who are really knowledgeable know it. So when we talk about peace, we've got to understand that foundation. And when you look at the AI that Dr. Ellsworthy talked about and all of this, again, I listen and I see what's transpiring so much in our society when it comes to AI and we're becoming a victim to it by a simple word that's become so commonplace with us now. The word that is destroying, I think, our society and it's so common now, social distancing. We as human beings were not designed to social distance, but we're becoming acclimatized and psychologically conditioned to be social distant. Our elementary school children now are being social distanced. And our strength has always been in a five letter word called touch, to touch each other. That's what Dr. Ellsworth was talking about, about how do we put, put in compassion, integrity. Machines can't do that now, but unless we acquiesce and give the machines the power. See, you give people power when you stop thinking a certain way. So when we think about peace, we keep peace because we think about peace and what peace can do. But today I'm so honored to be with this distinguished panel and the women for Black Women for Positive Change. I think back last week, we just won a, a federal case here in the district of uh, 11th District of Georgia where the Fearless Fund, five women had come together to give Black women uh, money to start businesses. It's called the Fearless Foundation and they had given away $3 million. And we won it last week, myself and Al Sharpton, we, we protested before the courthouse and the women. If you look up the Fearless Four or the Fearless uh, Foundation, these were women that raised $26 million just to give to uh, 40 women who are starting businesses. The man who fought them is the one who defeated the, the affirmative action on June the 28th of this year. Blum is his name, B-L-U-M. I believe in calling somebody out who's wrong. And he called it out. And he used the 1866 civil rights course to defeat these women. But they uh, they lost because anyone has a right to give the money to who they are to leave. But I think so much for today. When we talk about peace, I think about we got signs all over. No justice, no peace. I look back now and I'm so pleased just to be honored to be here. I started in the peace movement in 1960 with Dr. King. John was, I was 18, John Lewis was 20, Martin was 29, Andy Young was 28 years old, and we were all the kids. We did not know all of, but you cannot separate peace from human justice and civil rights and human rights, environmental rights. It's all about developing a peaceful effort. And peace always starts within. I love when I learned the Sri of breathing, breathing method in India, how I could find an inner peace by stopping and sucking in air and then blowing out the kind of anxiety that we all face when we're not in a peaceful state of mind. So consequently, peace always starts with me. Peace starts an inner peace with me. The reason we're seeing now the, this emerging mental illness even among our children is because they're not at personal peace. We're seeing illnesses in our nation because we're not at peace. So peace starts with the person. Then peace is in the home, peace is in the community, peace in, the, in our cities and certainly in our nation. And now peace must exist, but we don't see peace starting anywhere. It's even at the White House, on down to the outhouse, all of the terms that we use, peace is, is slowly uh, being evaporated. So we've got to come back to where peace. And the key to peace, I think one of the keys, and I constantly use the example that we use in the civil and the human rights movement, peace, in order to achieve peace, we've got to do be willing to do two things, which we don't want to really do in America, because we think we're the, the great company, country up on a hill, the lighted company on a hill, and we have no mistakes. One of the greatest travesties that we see now is that we're living in a society where no one wants to sacrifice nor risk. It's all about me, myself, and mine. In the civil rights movement, we were always, how do we sacrifice and how do we risk, even when somebody said it's not popular to stand up in a PTA meeting? We did not know or have all of the answers, but you know intrinsically that AI can't give you uh, what is right, what is wrong. How do we find the, the equity among races and cultures and religions and faith? So you might not have the answers, but you have a guiding force inside that you want to achieve. 
And peace is, is, is something that we want for. I never thought that I'd be standing on a, with all of these distinguished people here today, articulating peace. Not me, I started in the movement, went to jail 22 times, all of these kinds of things. Then a man came into my seat uh, at the 63 March. I'm speaking at the March in Washington about peace. We didn't know what it really meant, but we knew, as Dr. King says, peace is not merely the absence of uh, a, a, a violence, but peace is a conscientious effort which we move toward. And so we, you stand there, and I think that that's what we are right now, to, to try to find that kind of peace. I never thought when Sergeant Shriver came into my dormitory room in 1963 and said, we've got to talk about peace around the world. My brother-in-law has started a program. His brother-in-law was John F. Kennedy. He said, in order to have peace, we've got to do several things. And I could care less about what he was saying because I was concerned about voting rights and housing rights and human rights and gender rights and all of those. But then I began to connect the dots. If we're to have universal peace, we've got to connect the dots. There's not one channel or one avenue that's doing that. And he started talking about if we're going to do it, uh, we're starting a program. And I became one of the first in 1963 Peace Corps volunteers to go to Nigeria. Lived there for two years. And the first thing we did was to understand that all the world wants peace. There is no discrimination between whether you're white or black or rich or poor or male or female. There's a peaceful nature that we're looking for. So to go over there, and then I begin to understand that we're all one under God's anointed position. So we're looking for peace. And that, I think, put, the, put it in perspective. When I look at uh, Alfred Nobel, he thought peace was when he, uh, he came together, put dynamite, began to blow the world up. We found out that in order for us to really live in peace, we cannot use violence. We cannot use destructive powers, but we've got to come up with peace. So he came up with the Nobel what? Peace Prize, Oppenheimer, began to understand we've got to get away from all of this kind of, of, of angst and anger and distrust. We've got to learn how to communicate through the power of love. And in order to communicate, which is breaking down rapidly across the world, we've got to do three things, I think. It's important for us to, first of all, understand each other. And I can only begin to understand you when I understand that I don't understand you. If I think I understand you by knowing everything about you, then I'm wrong. So I've got to understand first that I don't understand you. And if I don't understand you, then I've got to understand you. Once I begin to understand you, I've got to give up some of my misunderstanding about you to understand because my misunderstanding has destroyed our communication. Then I've got to go to respecting you, respect our differences. Uh, I am different than you, you're different from me, but if I can understand our differences, then we can begin to communicate. And the third part of this is not only understanding each other, respecting each other, but the big one is breaking down now that destroys our peaceful pledge is that we don't trust one another. There's a tremendous amount of distrust and you cannot respect nor understand somebody if you disrespect them. And if you don't understand them, nor respect them, nor trust them, then you've got, uh, there's a, 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 a disconcerting effort and you can't be peaceful with that relationship. So we've got to understand those kinds of things as we move toward first being at peace with yourself. And today we are trying to, to merely survive. And the people that are in control have what we call a privileged mentality about power and maintaining their power, whether it's international war or whether it's right here in this, in this own country. So we've got to, 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 and somebody said it earlier, to talk to the business community. We just had a global leadership summit in Washington, D.C., and we were at the Grand Hyatt, and there were 2,000 people there, and they had us about business, the business community, and some of the most powerful country com companies were there talking about business, and here's what they're moving toward. We've got to now begin to treat and respect our employees because our employees now are not at peace, and they're beginning to not be as productive as they could, and the bottom line from all of those great uh, leaders that I listened to were talking about how do we once again go back to respecting the integrity of those who are working for us. And it goes back to what keep us, kept us going during the civil rights movement. You've got to ask the question, in order for me to attain peace in my, with, within myself, what am I willing to sacrifice? What am I willing to give up? What am I willing to risk? We are in an I society, but the I is always about me. Until you're willing to say, wait a minute, let me tear down these barriers that have locked me into my own little, uh, little, little box 
Because once you're in your box, you can never have peace. We've got to build, as they say, bridges from one box to another. So we've got to be at peace. And Dr. King says, our loyalties to attaining peace must, must become ecumenical rather than sectional. He always talked about peace and the, the kinds of quotes that he talked about that, that we must have it at, 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 at all the uh, avenues. So I think that what we're talking about now is extremely so, so valuable and part, important. And that's when you look at everything is interconnected, uh, interrelated. When you talk about love, you can't have love without peace. You can't have peace without understanding. You can't have a collaborative effort to lift all people from an economic point of view. But, we, but when I look at America, and I've been fighting it now for 63 years, and I tell young people all the time, listen, young people, if I can stay in this movement for 60 years, you can stand it for 60 minutes. If I can stand it for 60 years, you can sit down for six months and talk among yourselves. If I, and I'm not talking, I'm 82 years old now. So I didn't start in this just yesterday. And, and many times I wanted to give up. Many times I wanted to quit. Many times I wanted to turn around. But what is your cause? What is your mission? If your mission in your cause is peace and peace is the foundation for a brother and a sisterhood that is so essential before you start that. If you're not at peace with yourself, see, I'm like this. If you can't swim, don't come in here and try to save me. You stay on the bank, send somebody in that can swim. Uh, even now here in Atlanta, we're talking about training of police. We need trained police officers to de-escalate. Don't tell me don't train police, don't defund police. Let's train people so that if somebody's mugged, send me somebody in this train. So we've got to have those kinds of conversations. And so if it's about peace, then we've got to look at not only peace, uh, starting with ourselves and in our home. Our homes have become so socially distant that our children don't see examples of peace. And until we see among them, we've got all kinds of excuses as to why not be peaceful rather than trying to find reason to be peaceful. What is peace? understanding and allowing you to grow into your own place and I can respect where you are and your peace can strengthen my peace and my peace can strengthen your peace and when we strengthen each other then we got what we call global peace but in America whether we like it or not peace does not sell and we're in a country where selling on the capitalist system says you've got to sell this you sell bad news you sell breaking news you sell things that just shake you up can you imagine how much would it sell if I came in and said you know Three people got together today and they built a community that's loving. Uh-oh, break, break time, cut, cut. Send, bring in the story where the, <laughs> where the fireman destroyed the cat rather than taking the cat off of the roof. That doesn't sell. So we've got it in our own way and in our own way, but begin to convince people that peace does sell. Peace does keep harmony. Peace does give peace of mind. Peace can, watch this, here's the key word. Peace can be, and I fight this with business people, Excuse me, Dr. Ellsworth, I know we were talking about beef, beef, but peace, you can sell peace and it can make you money. And I fought it all along. The, the, peace, you can, peace can make money. You can have positive story. You can have positive energy. So as we talk about this today and we talk about how do we achieve it, peace starts at home. And I, I love when you took time between each one of us and you did this, you, you said, let's focus in. I had to learn to focus in. At one time in my life, if a white person said good morning to me, I thought they were lying because that was the atmosphere that I was in. If, 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 if they were speaking and something came in and they said it's raining, I didn't think it was raining. I thought it was spit coming out of the virulous words that came out of their mouth until I began to understand two words, their ignorance and their fear. We've got to eliminate ignorance and fear to move toward peace. If I'm ignorant about who you are, if I'm fearful of you, then I have to put you at a certain abeyance. But when I can feel the kind of inner peace, and that's what you did, let's take a deep breath, let's focus, let's come in. And what are we focusing on? And that's why I believe that the positive power of the black women and what's going on now is let's focus on an inner peace that begins to spread horizontally. And in order to spread horizontally, you've got to be connected vertically. And that's where a God, a Allah, a Buddha, whoever your deity might be, can give you an inner peace that you don't fear me. And I can, you can be powerful because you're powerful. I'm, that doesn't make me less powerful. My mother used to have a quote that guided me. Down not those who are down. Cheer them up in their sorrow. For this old world is a funny old world and you may be down tomorrow. We all need somebody wherever we are. 
and we can lift people up. If they see peace in your life, then they can find the peace. But right now we have so much angst. So it starts on a call like this, on a message like this, on people around the world, because we all want that, but we've got to step back and say, wait a minute, I can't share peace with you unless I'm at peace with myself. How can, how can a man talk about the equality of, of women only earning 65 to 75% on a dollar when he's still trying to get every nickel he can for himself? He doesn't want to share that. You've got to share and be uh, in, in order to grow. And, and I've often said, in, in order to do that, everything, how do we start with peace? Everything, before I say anything to anybody on this call, I had to think a word first. I start with a thought in my mind. And there was a man, I don't know if you've ever heard of Mahatma Gandhi before, but that's a man, he was around every, a few years ago. Somebody, he was a man that fought peace and we heard him talk about it earlier, but he had a personal action plan. And I think it's quite apropos today because he believed that everything began with a thought. And he said this, keep your thoughts positive because your thoughts become your words. Keep your words positive because your words become your actions. Keep your actions positive because your actions become your habits. Keep your habits positive because your habits become your values. Keep your values positive because your values become your destiny. And if our destiny is peace, we start with a thought. The thought of what I'm saying in a peaceful way. The thought of what I'm saying becomes my behavior. So we start with peace, not only peace uh, at the person, uh, as an individual, but in our home, and then of course, when it goes over into Ukraine, but politics and money, and we got to legislate. We thought by legislating the right to vote, the right to buy what you can, the right to access to equal education, we thought if we put it legislated and it was passed, it was passed and those were actions, but nothing was being done. So they came up with a strange little word that was just uh, destroyed on June the 28th. They came up with a word called affirmative action. And that was so frightening to people that they say, wait, they're taking our power. They're, they're going to take over. And they were, and fear and ignorance came. And it was really said, how do we level the playing field so that everybody can have a, a, a life of peace? Everybody can have a life where we can work together. So that's Amen. what we're doing now. Amen. So, yes. Amen. I'm so, Mr. I, I know that you have traversed the landscape with your storytelling from peace begins within to the family, to legislation, to international conflicts, to discipline, to sacrifice, and your decades long activities related to bringing peace. I am no doubt, I have no doubts that people are inspired and have responses. And so again, I ask all of us to take a moment it almost seems like you don't want to. You want to be carried away by the spirit of what Dr. Durley is sharing with us. And so I'm still going to ask that we take a moment and come to James from Cote d'Ivoire. Yes, sir. You've been waiting. Can you? Ah, there, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Uh, Braha, I'm so edified by the wonderful wisdom that I'm hearing in this space. Um, thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Sila. Thank you, uh, uh, Anna. Um, I think I can pass it well. And um, I just want to uh, bring in just a word a few ways that was just pumping in my heart when Gerard was speaking mm -hmm. and then also Asila was sharing. Asila um, talks about um, heart intelligence as opposed to versus artificial intelligence. And also uh, Gerard uh, came in and brought about inner peace and um, talks about the power of love and it talks about also ignorance and fear. Mm -hmm. um, I want to um, bring into our space mm -hmm. what during my uh, researching, I discover what 
a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State mm -hmm. and negotiator of the Camp David Accord mm -hmm. during the regime of Jimmy Carter, his name Dr. Harold Sounder. Um, he said something, said there are some things only government can do. This also responds to the chat of a question in the chat from mm -hmm. Schimmel that said, what must be the role of government and authorities in development of culture of peace? He said, there are some things only government can do, such as negotiating binding agreements, but there are some things that only citizens outside government can do, such as changing human relationship. Exactly. And in my many years of 11 years of peace building, facilitating reconciliation, I came to realize that to survive and to strive into an excellent future, our first step today is to protect the dignity of even uh, those who may, may consider others. And that reminds me that an enemy is one whose story we have not heard. Exactly. That is such a beautiful and place. To Jim. dignify one another, listening in circle instead of shouting in squares, for listening to learn humanizes and dignifies both the speaker and the listener. And the person with the will and the skill to listen has the power to transform the relationship and redirect the history. And we finally begin to discover one another as human and equal, then to want the best, not only for ourselves, but for the other equal. And this is freedom from fear and loneliness and freedom to travel safety, collaborate and create experience, the ecstasy of human reunion, life beyond words. Thank you so much, James. I am so deeply appreciative and so glad that we can also come back to hear those words of wisdom from West Africa that inspire us also. We are unfortunately getting to the end of our program for today. I am enormously grateful for all of you who have chosen to spend your time with us today, who have chosen to listen as each one of our panelists encourages us to do. That is where it begins. Peace begins within, it begins with our own listening. I also cannot end today. There are two things I will say. One is please take a look at the month of nonviolence activities. Know that you can be inspired by the children around the world who are sitting in circles, as James encourages us to do. And as Dr. Durley asks us, what are we willing? I, I want to actually at this moment ask, there are several things that Dr. Durley spoke of and that Diane asked us to do. We will share the list with you. We will share the recordings with you so that some of you have asked for the amazing quotations by our panelists. Um, we will share this with you. I would like to ask though, in this age of me, mine, what are you willing to sacrifice? Dr. Durley asked us. What am I willing to sacrifice in order to bring peace? If you are willing to make a sacrifice, I'm going to ask you all to share that in the chat as we listen and have Dr. Holmes, close out this meeting today with a few words. Dr. Holmes, would you please- and Before, before Reverend Holmes prays us out, just let me thank everyone. Let me thank our outstanding panelists, really. I was getting chills listening to each of our panelists. You're brilliant. We really appreciate your thoughts, Dr. Durley, Dr. Scilia, and uh, Reverend Holmes, and, and the Chancellor, outstanding. And thank you, Prabha, for being the moderator today. 
We greatly appreciate your participation. So thanks to all of you. Please join our network, blackwomenforpositivechange.org. This is the month of nonviolence. It's not too late. Make a donation, be supportive. And we can do this, people. We can make these changes. So thank you very much to all of you. Reverend Holmes. To God be the glory. The esteemed Reverend Dr. Benjamin Mays, noted theologian and the former dean of the Howard University School of Divinity, my alma mater, is author of these most profound words. I only have a minute, only 60 seconds in it. For it's upon me, I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it, I didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I abuse it, give account. If I don't use it, a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. A bishop once said, there are two ways for a leader to go through life. Number one, as a thermometer, or number two, as a thermostat. A thermometer tells the temperature, measure the climate, but a thermostat sets the tone and creates the climate. And that's who you are, our global leaders. You're the thermostat. You're setting the tone, creating the climate, not only in the United States of America, Africa, Asia, they're all, all over the world, but you're setting the tone, creating the climate through the will of God. Jesus gave parables, and so we have one here in our closing benediction. Growing up as a little boy from Mississippi, I know that there were two types of trees. The first, type of tree that I noticed was called the palm tree. What I noticed about the palm tree is that whichever, which way the wind blows, the palm tree goes. In other words, if the wind blows to the left, the palm tree goes to the left. And if the wind blows to the right, the palm tree goes to the right. In other words, whichever which way the wind blows, the palm tree goes. But I noticed yet another type of tree. In Mississippi, and that tree was called the oak tree. And what I know is about the oak tree is that it did not matter which way the wind blow, whether it blow to the left or to the right, the oak tree remains strong. My global leaders for peace, there is one thing that I can assure you. And that as you continue to go the route of peace, there will be winds. Winds come. But winds do go. Winds come, but winds do go because I've never yet seen winds stay. So in the midst of the blowings of the wind, you keep looking up until the hills from which cometh your help, knowing that your help cometh from the Lord. And don't you dare sway. To the left, not to the right, remain strong in the power of the Almighty God. God be with you, my peace warriors, my brothers and sisters from around the world. Keep hope alive. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. And let all of God's children say, amen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Holmes. Thank you, Prabha. Thank you, Dr. Durley. Thank you, Chancellor Eubanks. Thank you, Scalia, with your power shut off and thank you Hattie Carlos outstanding Ooh. and what a group of people I was keeping notes on who's here we've got South Korea Quebec Florida Israel many states in the United States Cape Town South Africa Malawi United Kingdom Scotland wow and people making beautiful contributions here is David Newman dedicating his entire time and wealth to peace building. And James, who's been doing that, it is amazing to see what people are willing to contribute in order to build peace, beginning with the inside. Well, thank you all. What does it say when the hour is upon us and we're all still here? Hello. <laughs> Our so coach here, Don, uh, Honorable Don on. Hester, is here with us also. Hello there, Don. Honorable Don Hester, treasurer of the city of Norfolk. She was a part of the of the call. 
Yes, it's amazing. We're all still here. What do you guys want to say? Any thoughts, Reverend yes, Reynolds? I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something. Go ahead, please go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to say that um, the first step that we can do towards peace um, politically is vote for peace. Thank you. Um, you know, as we're getting into elections um, all over the world, there are certain politicians or certain political parties that um, push war, that push instability. Right now, um, dealing with um, the instability that's going on in Haiti, the instability sometimes that happens in my country, Jamaica, and a lot of it is perpetrated by us in the United States <clears throat> in that we take sides with various ruling parties or op opposing parties, and we give them weapons and we give them money and we give them the means to de-safe stabilize the government so we can get who we want in power. I say that when we're voting, the next time we vote, do not vote for those people. Let's vote peace. Let's not vote personality. Let's not vote political party. Let's vote peace. And if we do that, it will be much better. And that's the only way to go. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say this. Um, and some of you know, I was the biographer and memoir for Coretta Scott King. And I traveled with her for 30 years. And one thing she taught us is to have a life of peace that peace you know even when um churches were being burnt down when when people were being ch chased and chastised uh she she would not let us condemn them i i had some words i had to say so, but she would, not, she would always say there's some good in there everybody and to pray for them and so we can do small things, like in our families, I noticed the, the anger. I, I noticed the anger in Washington, D.C., that where people, young children, are being uh, shot, killed, that, that our cities are, are not always safe for, for children. So, and you know, as we go about, be examples of what we, we, we want, be the change we want to see. In all that, whatever gift we have, like like so many of you have said, contribute that, you know, in a in a kind way, uh, contribute what you have because right now we're building a legacy for other people, and if we don't continue to walk in peace, talk in peace, and like my sister said, vote in peace, uh, we will have disorganized chaos. So this, this group was so important so that we won't get our, our hopes uh, discounted and, and dreams deferred. That, that you get you come to a, a place like that, you see people all over the world uh, wanting to work for a same cause. It makes you get off of this, this, this moment and continue with, with more hope in our veins and love in our hearts. It is a life-changing experience. Any other closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to uh, bring in that um, I think it's the high time globally, um, notwithstanding the geographic location, to emphasize on transformative learning transformative education and uh, leadership skill programs in schools, and, uh, um, even in primary schools, because I think that will really um, address early the problem of culture of violence. Because um, when we begin to understand that kids need to learn how to manage failure, depression, anger, um, how to manage anxiety, uh, because when these key skills are not taught in schools or when this kind of awareness are not revealed in school environment, you discover that kids will choose bully in order to control his temperament. So I think myself here in West Africa, I created a program that I am offering to the young adults, um, the young ones, even kids, the transformative learning bringing um, a curriculum whereby we create experience, we create informations, 
we teach kids on how to identify their emotional and leverage their emotional intelligence and how to regulate their emotional temperament of value-based decisions and their behavior. So you find that, that in schools, if culture of peace education is going to be a reality, then we need to bring that into schools. And we know that schools are working on a policy framework. And most of the policy framework of education, sometimes they are, they are very close. They don't open to all this kind of, maybe I may call parallel educational programming that helps for behavioral uh, development, character development at early stage, even a young adult. So I think- Thank you, James, um, thank you. Of, yeah, thank you. We have one yes. more comment from Zana. I have Zana a in the United, yeah, she's in the and United States. We have Dr. Durley close us out, right, sir? Hi. Um, Zana. Zana. <laughs> My name is Jana, and I'm in London. Greetings, everyone. It's Greetings. been a very inspiring evening. I just want to follow on from what the last gentleman was saying. When Marshall Rosenberg was developing NVC, nonviolent communication, he really wanted to work with people in Israel and Palestine. And mm -hmm. so he did. He worked with people in Israel and Palestine for quite a while. And he wasn't getting anywhere. And I think he was probably feeling quite fed up and frustrated because he wasn't getting anywhere. So what he realized in the end is that he needed to work with the children. Mm. Right? And he saw people as young as four using MVC. He said, if I hadn't seen it myself, I wouldn't believe it. <laughs> right? um, so sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to share this information with the next generation and give them the strategies that they can use to bring about positive change. It may not happen in our lifetimes, right? Well, absolutely. We, and well, during we, the month of nonviolence, we have over 55 peace circles. Mm -hmm. And anyone on this call can sign up at monthofnonviolence.org and you will get a free peace circle toolkit that you can use in your community that two of our brilliant people have written, Kim, uh, Kim Best and um, Renata Valry. So yes, we agree with you, James. The peace circles in the schools are critical. So thank you. And thank you, Zana, for your comments. Thank and you the for people the here, if you're interested, I know Chijioki put some of his materials up earlier. Please share your contact information if you want others to know. I know that he is teaching children in Nigeria every day. Beginning with our children is critical. Absolutely true. So go ahead, Dr. Durley. I, I think there's a song that they're singing all over the world, let there be peace, but let it begin with me. Children, it's one thing to talk to children in classrooms and teach children. At one time here in Atlanta, I had 4,000 children in our Head Start program, 4,000 in 19 sites. But what I learned is that children learn from what they see, not necessarily what they hear. And so it starts with organizations like those on the phone. What do they see? They they hear peace in the in the setting, and then they go home and they see nothing. So we've got to now get with us. They see it at the White House. They see it in legislation. So there's the role that we must play, so the children can see a peace in our life. How can, when I go to the grocery store and I see somebody teaching, talking about peace, and the mother's grabbing their child, snatching them, telling them to shut up and sit down, they've got to see peace from their mothers, peace from their adopted fathers. And that's where we come in and organizations like a, a black, a black Women for Positive Change. How do we, they see peace? They got to see peace. Otherwise, here's what they see, hypocrisy. They teach us peace, but they live hate. So our role now from a cause like this is to let somebody see you at the drugstore today. When you're getting gas, wherever you are on a practical sense, let them see peace acted out in our own behavior. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, thank you all for joining us. We're gonna wrap up now and we hope we will- Wrap up you, again. Network again with you guys. We wanna do this again soon. So be sure we have all your information and blackwomenforpositivechange.org. You know, we're just a network all over the world now. And so we're glad to have you and just appreciate you so much. And thank you, Reverend Dr. George Holmes for introducing us to Dr. Durley. We're just thrilled. 
And it was great to meet Reverend Dr. Diane Moore Eubanks, introduced by Frank Malone. So, hey, quite a network, folks. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Meyer, so so long. Bye-bye. Have a great day.